It is beginning to look a lot like Christmas everywhere we go, right? It's just, uh, here we are. Uh, so this is Christmas. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> uh, it's an interesting time and in all we're having, but we are, I'm excited as we start this new teaching series, and it's going to be a, a bit different. Christmas, let's just say it's going to be a bit different this year, but we're looking and saying, how could it be different? It could be good. What is the good and the different that we're going to be approaching? So uh, go with me on this. I, I, I hope that we can journey together and some great opportunities because Christmas is our our season, Christians. Our, our season of, of celebrating the greatest thing that's ever happened to the globe is Jesus coming. And so we, we're going to make it, we're going to make it big. It's going to be different in a good way. And we're believing for that. Uh, as uh, Logan mentioned about, you know, we, we've got this, the Santa event coming up here and you're thinking, Santa, why are we doing Santa? Guess what? We're going to have an opportunity. Many of you want to see Santa, but we're going to present some opportunities for people to really connect them with Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, if you're online, you know, mark your calendar, spread the word, put it on, put it on Facebook, you know, Instagram, pass the word in these next couple of weeks to really a great little drive-through opportunity to connect people uh, to, to Christ through through this event. And the other thing that we're doing is other things we will be offering. Of course, we're going to have Christmas Eve services. If you're wondering, are we having Christmas Eve? Yes, we will. We'll have those that information coming out here in this next week on details. But we want to mention one more time the Advent Guide. The Advent Guide is, and I don't know if you know what the word Advent means. It means coming. And so the, the, each year that really it's more, more of a traditional church thing that does this. But Advent is this idea of like looking ahead of the, 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 the coming of Christ. Obviously, Jesus already came, but we also look ahead of him coming again. And so each week has a different theme. Last week was on hope. This week's on, on peace. And so if you did not get a family guide or you can use it as an individual uh, resource, we want to make one available to you. Obviously, there's a few left here and those in the chairs on your seats. You can take one with you if you didn't get one or know a friend that will want one. They're, they're ready to go because they're dated and ready to be used. But if you're online and you're going, I really want one of these, I will do this. I will deliver you one this week. I had fun last week dropping off a couple of them. And the reason I want to do that is not just how, you know, I want to be able to get this resource to you, but it's a great excuse to see you. And so I'd love just to stop by, do, do a little uh, knock on the door on your porch and, and give you one or drop one off. So let us know. You can text us in the line or email us. Let us know. We'd love to get one over to you. Well, it is Christmas, and it's, yeah, it's going to be a little bit different this year. And I, I like our series that we're going into, rather than going, oh, this, so this is Christmas. Yeah, so this is Christmas. Really thinking about what can we, we can look ahead and what we can really be doing, what we, we can be about. But as, as saying it's going to be different, it's kind of an understatement. Uh, I think that we all are kind of, you know, this last summer going, oh, what, is it going to it be like this? What's the holidays? Well, here we are and what we're doing. And so even 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 Thanksgiving was different for a lot of us, right? We we weren't able to have the large gatherings, at least legally, to have those gatherings. And and so we, my own family, we did that. We had a small little gathering at home and first time cooking a turkey in 18 years. I'm still here and my family's still alive, though they just got out of the hospital. That's a terrible joke. I will not do that. Um, but they here's the thing. As much as I miss people and all that happened with Thanksgiving, there's one thing I have to, I want to admit I really, truly, truly missed. That was pecan pie. And it's not just any old pecan pie, but my sister-in-law Kim's chocolate pecan pie. You need to understand how wonderfully amazing this pie is, okay? It not only changes your life, but it will change your blood sugar very quickly, okay? But... <laughs> Here, here's the thing. Like, we dish it out. Like, it's it's rationed. And, like, there's not enough of it. Like, there's, like, people get bigger as, the, you know, as, like, they get older. And so then the pie is, like, people fight for this pie. So it's divided out evenly. I mean, it's it's a big deal, this pecan pie. And, and but I miss it. I miss it. Pecan pie. I don't know what you're missing already, but we know it's, things are going to be different. Our holiday functions, not just a day, but really the, the entire holiday season there's festivities. Let's just face it. They're not, they're not going to happen, the, at least the way that we like them to happen. And I found with this, with, with Christmas season, it's, it is the most wonderful time of the year, and it's the most dysfunctional time of the year at the same time. It's kind of a love-hate relationship. I saw someone, a friend of mine, post something about how he hated Christmas. I'm like, there was a lot of, there was a lot of, uh, like, 
you know, Grinch, like, memes, you know, and stuff, and gifts toward them that way, you know, like, bro, what's up with that? But we kind of get that a little bit, don't we? And and because I think there's these expectations that we have that are so wrapped up in, into Christmas, you know, you got to buy the, the right gift, you know, and I'm telling you, like, what do people do outside of apps? What do we buy them right now, nowadays? You know, what is it that we're going to buy? I, I found it's kind of in the, in the lights, you know, like, I, you know, my neighborhood is, like, lit up, like, a crazy. I mean, I got the Griswolds across the street from me. I'm like, oh, I better put some lights up. There's some pressure. There's some expectations that are need to be filled out. The right gift, the right lights, you know, the right the right things to do. But I found this with Christmas as well. It's not just doing the right stuff. It's actually challenging and, and the right relationships that we have. That the expectations of relationships. You know, being somewhere and being with those people. And this year it's going to be different. Now, some of you are secretly going, I'm glad this year. Some of you going, you know what, that, that awkward office party that I have to go to every year, I don't have to go this year. Some of you are thinking that way. You know what, don't raise your hand if that's you. Some of you are online, you're like, yeah, that's what you. I don't have to go to that extended family gathering with that creepy uncle, okay? I'm just saying, if you're the creepy uncle, we'll pray for you. But, you know, I'm, you know it, here's the, those things are out there, but yet, it's different this year. It's a challenge in the difference it's going to be. And as we move into the season and that there's these expectations that are there and that we're accustomed to that we don't get to do, and there is going to be, let's just call it out, a level of disappointment that we're going to have. This week in the Advent Guide, this last week we talked about hope. There's a sense of already we're feeling disappointment that actually actually causes us not to have a whole lot of hope in this holiday season. I was kind of thinking of the correlation between hope and disappointment. You know, hope is what you need, right? It's what gets you out of bed, or at least your spouse nudging when the alarm's going off and getting moving in the day. Hope gets you going. Go, hope gets us up thinking ahead in the future and preparing for the what's, what's ahead. Hope kind of is what we need. And yet I was correlating hope and disappointment this week, and I thought about why we're disappointed. And I think in some ways it's misappointed, disappointed. I was thinking of the word. It's misappointed hope or misdirected hope. This other week, the other day, I was thinking about this and kind of like doing a little research on what really causes behind being disappointed. And, and Psychology Today and their website had a blog, and it really had this, this what disappointment, when it happens, and there's some reasons for that. First one we have in, you, in your notes there is this. We can believe that only a certain thing can make us happy. When disappointment happens is we can believe that only a certain thing can make us happy. Pecan pie for me. Some of you, bro, bro you got to let the pecan pie go. It's not going to happen for you this season. That's what, you gotta, that's what you gotta, you're telling me right now. But I want you to think about what expectations do you have. They're not going to be met this holiday season. They're just not. It's just going to be different. Here's another thing about when points to disappointment when it happens is this. When we believe a certain person is the only one who can fulfill our desires. Man, that's a lot of pressure on that person, isn't it? And when they don't live up to what they should be living up to, you're disappointed. You're disappointed in them. And that's an issue for so many of us. Because in all seriousness of this is that this season, you're, we're not going to be gathering with certain people people that you're going to miss, and they're going to miss you. And isolation and loneliness is, is, a, is an issue, and it only magnifies on the holidays. Also this, when disappointment happens, we set a time limit for how long it will take to get what we want. Oh, how long is this going to be? When are we going to get through this? And we, and I think much of it has to do our, our, our tension span, our tolerance. We want things to happen like that. We still complain about internet speed, and you have the highest internet speed in the world, and you're like, it's, too, it's not quick enough for me. <laughs> we do this when it comes to things being shipped, and things, and our, our tension span, our, our tolerance is getting lower and lower and lower because of, of things improve. So in our Instagram world, we struggle, don't we? It's not coming when I want it to come. We get, another thing of disappointment is we get fixed ideas about how it's all going to come together. So not it will get done, it, but it's not the way that I wanted it to be done. That's not what I. That's not how we do this. And so we get caught up in that, and all these disappointment, disappointment, disappointment. It does in some ways lead us to a place of despair, depression, and it 
gives us this sense of hopelessness that comes over us, this perpetual issue of disappointment in our life. Now, some of you are going, I wasn't really feeling great today, and now I just feel lower. Thank you, Dan, for your incredible encouragement today. You know me, I point out the obvious. Here's the problem, right? This is the problem. Let's just call it out for what it is. It's going to be different. But what if different could be good? What if different actually could be? What if Christmas, as we know it, of what we hope for, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen, what if it happened? What if it happened in an unexpected way? What if we redirected our hope? Because where do we hope? What do we look to our hope? Rather than direct our hope inwardly to what we want and what we expect of others, what if we directed our hope back to God and that what he has and what he's promised? Here we go again, another year of Christmas, and this one's going to be different. Can I remind us that Christmas once didn't exist? Can kind it of remind us that Christmas and what we know and look back, it didn't happen, at least quite yet. Uh, what happened along the way was something pretty amazing where people were hoping, but it didn't come. Generations after generations after current generations. And if you're hoping to get through what we're getting through, you've got to hang on. Because you've got to keep, you understand the big picture and the big perspective before even Christmas came about. Before the first Christmas, long before, generations after generations, Men and women were anxious for the birth of the Messiah. That's in Hebrew. In Greek, it was the Christ, the, which means the anointed one, the one that would come to be the Savior of the world. And they waited, and they waited. In fact, if you look in Scripture between Malachi, which was the last book of the Bible, and then in the first book of the Bible in Matthew, 400 years people waited. They call it the silent period. There was no prophecy, there was no prophets, there was no revelation, there was no written scripture that was what we have in the, script, in the Bible at all for 400 years, right? Some of you the other day, you know, were social distancing in Costco, and you're like, oh, look at the long line, right? Waiting that long, right? is a long time, 400 years of silence. And I think for us is that when we put that in perspective is that we know in our lives there's a lot of waiting. We know in our lives and in the waiting we begin to doubt. We begin to go, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing it this way? And we have these sets of expectations that God's not coming through the way he's want to do it and with the people he's want to do it. And we get discouraged and because it leads to this place of depression and, and hopelessness. If you ever thought this way of life, especially this year, guess what? The Christmas story is for you and I. And what I want to describe today is call it unexpected hope. Now, it sounds like an oxymoron because hope is something you expect for. But I would say as we look at the Christmas story, really it's about unexpected hope. 400 years of silence, there came a moment. There came a moment in history, and the Bible records. In fact, Luke is actually the first recording of their utterance of hope that came was came in a very unexpected way four centuries of silence god spoke to a jewish people and specifically one humble priest to reveal his plan you go almost like the crack of the dawn of light that came and it was to the small remnant of people that were holding on hope and it's found in Luke's gospel, chapter 1. And I want to just paraphrase the first few verses in Luke 1, where Luke writes to a guy named Theophilus. We don't know much about except Luke references him. Some would say that he's writing this to him because he might be a publisher, meaning he's going to be the one that's going to take it and get manuscripts out to spread the gospel of Jesus that Luke was writing. We don't really know who he is. All we know is he's probably some Roman official, very high up, but a follower of Jesus and a, and, and a convert uh, to Christianity. And at the end of it, or right at the end of that little section, Luke says this, I'm writing to this so you can find the certainty of what is to come. And here it is. Chapter 1, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, Judah, there would be the famous, this would be the famous Herod the Great, there was a priest named Zechariah. Now it's interesting, the name Zechariah means God remembers. Now keep that, remember that. God remembers. It's so significant in this account that God has not forgotten this promise he's about to fulfill. And here it is, who 
belonged to the priestly division, Agenai, his wife Elizabeth, who was also a descendant of Aaron. Luke gets very specific on a couple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they have a significant heritage. They're part of a priestly line. They were raised in the temple of God. They, this generation of priests, this community of priests were raised up in a very, very dark time in Israel's history. Again, hundreds of years have passed, and, and they kept on following the rituals and following the Jewish calendar. Year after year after year, generations of them came, but they clung to the hope. This remnant clung to this hope that the Messiah would come one day. But generations passed, generations go, and then as the Persians were invaded by the, the Greeks and then the, and then the Romans, and, and, and all of a sudden, Jerusalem is under siege as Rome comes in. And, and history tells us in 65 BC, a, a conqueror named Pompeo comes through, and the, the, it is recorded that he goes up the southern stairs of the temple on his horse, dismounts, goes straight into the temple, goes straight into the, the sacred place of the Jewish people, the place that they, they worship the Lord, the place that was built, that's God's chosen temple that he would dwell. And then he goes directly into the Holy of Holies. It was told that if you went into this place, this most holy place, you know, and, not, and did it in an irreverent way, and did it in a, in a brash way, you could be struck dead. Well, guess what? Pompey comes out of there, nothing hurting him, and basically desecrates the temple. And what they found is this, because of the fear of the Romans, and because of what he did and demonstrated, many Jews fell away. But yet, there was this remnant that hung in there. There was a group of people, just small few people, says, we're not going to give up. We're going we're gonna to believe and trust in the hope that this is a dark day, and this, that, that there's hope that's coming, that one day would, would happen, that it would take place. Something incredible. And here comes along, guess what? Zechariah. Zechariah of a boy. You, you would you, you need to understand this. Zechariah, during that time, he probably was a little boy during the time this happened. And yet, him and his family stayed faithful. And he grew up and became a priest. Even though all that happened, he said, no, I am not going to desert my faith. And Zechariah was named his mom and his dad on all that was going on was named the lord remembers still filled with hope but it would come in such an unexpected way the bible says that a description of this couple luke affirms the faithfulness of zachariah and elizabeth and he says this both of them were righteous in, in the sight of god observing all the lord's commands and decrees blamelessly and what i love about that is not only they're faithful to the duties that they have but they're blameless meaning they're they're right in heart that god was going to use he doesn't want just people to do the right thing he also wants people with the right heart and look at verse seven it says when they were childless because elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old you need to recognize that barrenness was not only, well, not at all, look, it was heartbreaking for people, but sadly it was a curse. Then people, people didn't just feel sorry for you, they looked down upon you. And, and as, as much as thankfully that's different in our culture today, some people that you know or people here, people that are watching have experienced that. You, you might have had, a, you're childless in your life and you always wanted a child or, you know, one in eight people, uh, you know, couples will have, uh, you know, have a, a miscarriage. It's a reality for so many people. So you understand barrenness. But I think all of us understand barrenness. That we go through seasons in our life and like we're working really hard. We're doing so much. We're trying to be faithful. We're trying to be faithful. It doesn't seem like God's coming through. At least not yet. And yet what we find is a faithful couple for many, many, maybe even decades. And here's hundreds of years of centuries of silence. Now is going to be broken. Look at verse 8. It says, Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by Lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense had come, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. 
what was happening here is there's so many there was there's was many priests that are part of the temple and really it was almost a once in a lifetime opportunity who's chosen by a lot not you might be able to do this maybe two three times or maybe even one time in your lifetime that you get to do what this duty a specific duty that you're trained for and prepared for it's like winning the lottery like wow now, hey Zachariah, now it's your day it's your big day you get to do this well little did he know that he would not be prepared for what was about to happen and what he was going to encounter here it comes the glimmer. Here comes the, here comes the revelation of what is about to, to happen here. It says in verse 11, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zachariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zachariah. Your prayer has been answered. Do not be afraid. Here is the moment that silence is broken by this one angel. And what he says, don't be afraid. Why was he telling him don't be afraid? Because he was afraid. <laughs> I would be afraid. Sometimes when angels, have you noticed, I got to say this every time, it's like, you notice when angels appear, everybody's afraid. It's because, you know, they're thinking angels, they can't, they're, they're nice. I got them a little, ones out of my mantle, little baby angels at like Valentine's. No, Bible angels are fierce, okay? They're warriors, okay? He was afraid. But then it says, interesting, it says, your prayer has been answered. Think about this. Your prayer has been answered. What a great response to have from the Lord. Wouldn't that be great? You know, some of you, you know, when, you, when someone texts you or, or, you know, Facebooks you and it says, seen the message, oh, they got it. They at least, did they respond back? No. <laughs> uh, but they, you know, they, they, they got it. I, and, and I just want to say, some of us just be in all seriousness, I feel like right now God's, God's on, leaving us on red, doesn't he? It just seems like that's, that's what we've felt at times. And yet, here, Zachariah hears his prayer has been heard. Now, what prayer? What prayer? Well, I think it's the prayer. His prayer that him and his wife have been praying for years or maybe decades. Look at the next verse. It says, your, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will call him John. John is, uh, in, in Hebrew, is Johan. And you know what's interesting? It means God's favorite. So if your name is John, good for you, right? If you're watching online, your name's John. What a great name, right? If, you are, if, if you're not the favorite in the family, guess what? You're God's favorite. You can't beat that, right? <laughs> that's, pretty, that's pretty awesome. So this angel gets right to the point of this promise. Child. It says, he will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, and he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented fruit, which is a, a you can read about that, about the, it's a vow of Nazarite. And he will be filled with Holy Spirit even before he is born. That kid is fearfully, as the Bible says, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and their disobedience of the wisdom of the righteous. That's a powerful kid and what God's called them to do. And it specifically says, bring them back. Or bring them back to what? Well, remember, there was a remnant only left of Israel, of the Jewish people. People have turned away and generations turned away because they lost, they lost hope. And here, Zechariah had this humble job about what he was going to do and what God's called them to do. Of course, bring back. Well, here, here, here is the prophetic word that happens this baby, some of you know, grew up and became John the Baptist. And it says of what John ended up doing, that he'll be this. That he's going to say this. I'm in the voice of the one calling in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. And then John the Baptist called people to baptism. Now, why is that? Well, John, as they know, historians, what we learn about John is this, is that he apparently was a part of a group called the Essenes in an area called Qumran. John grew up, and then he was trained to go, and, and he must have felt this calling. Obviously, it's directed all the way from birth. Maybe his parents encouraged him toward this, and he said, John, you're special. You're God's favorite. You got it. God's got a plan. And John goes to this, this desert area called Qumran and meets with the Essenes. Well, the Essenes, I, and I've been to the location. It's a pretty cool location out in the, 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 the desert in Israel, high desert. It's where they found the Dead, dead Sea Scrolls. And when you go around, you, in the ruins of it, there's all these little, like, like uh, holes. All these holes are dug, and, and they're called mikvahs. They're, they're holes where they're, they're, 
they put water in, cestrines, where they would do spiritual baptizing. Spiritual cleansing. That's where the baptism thing all came about is they believed in cleansing, I guess, um, cleansing is next to godliness because they were really clean. And so John came, and the Bible says, came back from the desert and came back into Jude, you know, Jerusalem, and came actually specifically in Galilee, and began to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And really what John's job was to make ready a, a people prepared for the Lord. John's job was to prepare for Jesus to come. So here it is. God chooses this one guy to break the silence 400 years to reveal his divine plan. And now listen to, to Zachariah's response. Zachariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man. And I love how respectful he is about that. He says, my wife is well along in years. I was like, you know, good, I always think about this. Good job, Zach, man, bro. You know, because if you called her lady, you know, that that's that's not good, because I don't, how you know, wives, it'll come back around on you, guys, you know that'll, that'll happen, so that was a good call on his part, but here's the response to it, didn't, the angel didn't receive it well, he says this, he says, the angel said to him, I'm Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak you uh, to you and tell you the good news, well, what was the good news? Well, the great news, that, that your son is going to help prepare for the son through the good news, the message of, of the Messiah coming, the Savior of the world. But here's the irony in the whole encounter. It's humorous not to, not to Zechariah, though. It, it, what happens is in 400 years of pro, no prophecies, no prophets, no revelation, 400, four centuries of silence, good old Gabe breaks the, the waiting period with this. He says, now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you do not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. <laughs> he's like, here he he's, has this opportunity. Here is the guy to do it. And now that Zechariah can't talk. <laughs> God, you know, talk about restrictions to feel, right? Feel that, here it is. Like, what is going on? And, and well, it's an appointed time. God's perfect timing that's going to be revealed. Look at what says, Scripture says next. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering what, why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized they have seen a vision of the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. Here, Zechariah had the revelation, had, he was basically, here's a sign from God of this happening, and guess what? He can't, he has to sign language his way through the pregnancy of his son. Elizabeth does become pregnant, so that becomes fulfilled. She meets with her cousin Mary, and the Mary, which we'll talk about more next week in her story. And, and it's interesting, the encounter, if you read there in Luke 1, is that Mary and and Elizabeth are together, and when Mary is with Elizabeth, in, with child of John, the Bible says that John leaped in her womb when she, when she was with Mary. How many know unexpected hope is, is, is gestating at times? It's not there yet. It's coming. There's a hope that's happening in a very unexpected way that was going to take place. Family members, and when the birth of the child came and John's bored, they're like, what are we going to name him? Why don't we name him? Why don't you name him Zachariah like his daddy? And, and John's like, no, no, he can't talk still, right? He's like, he's signaling us. What does he want? John, what are you trying to, or, or Zachariah, what are you trying to say? And he goes and gets a tablet, a little chalkboard, and, and he writes the name John. I'm like, oh, John, huh. That sounds great. God's favorite. That's a good title. I love how the passage ends here. It says, Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was set free. And he was began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe. And throughout the hill country of Judea, the people were talking about all the things. Everyone who heard this wondered about and asking, what then is this child going to be? And I love, you read on, and John can't, he, or, I keep saying John, Zachariah couldn't speak for many, many months, and then there's a whole long song that's recorded in Luke. I'm like, the guy probably couldn't shut up after he couldn't talk for a while. Beautiful, beautiful song describing John's role and what's going to happen. What's this child? What is going to happen? Well, he becomes, as mentioned, John the Baptist, and ushering in the kingdom, ushering in Christ and what he's going to come and what he's going to do to be the Savior of the world, and it comes in such an unexpected way. You really could call it unexpected hope. Nobody, nobody planned for this. 
Nobody thought it would be this way. Nobody dreamed that Christmas would be like this Christmas back then and for us today. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean for this Christmas? What do we do with this, this first encounter, this, this unexpected hope? It means for this Christmas. Well, here's a few practical things I want to leave you with. First is this. Know this and all of it. That God does his best, way, best work in the waiting. You've heard me say it over and over. It's so true. God does his best work in the waiting. We all have this in common. When are we going to get through this? When is there going to be a vaccine? When are we going to get on the other side of it? We all feel it. If you're complaining right now, we get you. We're with you, okay? We get it. You don't have to let us know that. But we're all in the middle of all of this. We're all going it. And yet, I've found in my own life is this, that God does so great work in the middle of it. That he's revealing himself in deep, deep ways. Look at here, four centuries go on, and then Gabriel reveals to Zechariah this, it would happen in an appointed time. The baby would be born. Not just John will be born, which is a huge, amazing thing, but the, bo- the baby would be born, the Savior of the world. Listen, if you're, if you're challenged with a perpetual state of disappointment, is it quite possible, you don't mean to do this, I, I get it, is it quite possible, though, that you are putting God on your timeline? Is it quite possible that you're continually be disappointed because it's not the way you wanted it and the way and when it you need to want it and how you wanted it and disappointment, disappointment, and disappointment. Somehow, you don't mean to do this. I, I understand. I know no one wants to play, be, play God, but maybe you are. Maybe you and I are playing God at times going, I don't understand. If I was God, I would, you know, clo- you know you're not. And I'm not. God's bigger on us. Is he revealing something? Is he showing something? Absolutely. Look, I, I want to remind us how unique, I know as unique as this holiday season, but this, this fits in every season of our life. Second Peter tells us this of, of God's timeline. He says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, <laughs> you and I. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone come to repentance. Do you see the divine work? Do you see the greater redemptive work? Not just this Christmas, but it can be this Christmas. Of people being redeemed, people finding hope, people truly finding the Savior of the world. If any opportunity could be, would it be this Christmas and all that we've gone through and everything, how unique this season in in our entire lives. Could that be the hope? A, A hope for people, absolutely, believing for it. What's the goal? They would not perish, but everyone come to repentance. We ask, what is God doing in the work in you right now? Ask yourself these questions as he does. God, what are you teaching me? God, how are you stretching me? What is it you want me to do to prepare for others to come to know you this Christmas season? How do I set aside my rights and my things and what I want and my life to what you truly want to do? He does the best work in us. And see, knowing this, I, God really revealed this to me in my life, and my, is this, is that, yeah, God can fix things, but that's not always his plan. In fact, I've felt this this week, God speaking to me, is that God is more interested in, in captivating my heart than fixing my problems. It's true, isn't it? You know, and you think, well, yeah, you know, but if I, if he just fix this, we're so into fixing things and trying to bring solutions to things. God is at work in each one of us, and he wants us to allow that deep work in us to do a great work through us. And how I respond to that is so important. And I encourage you, yeah, it's going to be different, but do we respond in, into the knowing there's going to be one day a positive outcome? See, know this, you can put this in, and what this Christmas is about is that faithfulness eventually brings fulfillment. Faithfulness eventually brings fulfillment. We see this so truly, this humble servant here, this priest, and, it, and God pro- gave him this wonderful child, but what was so unique about it, this greater work that he was doing beyond them. But I love the fact that they lived, the Bible says, blameless. It doesn't mean they're perfect. I mean, poor Zach doubted, and then he was muted for nine months. It's not like he got it right completely, right? But God says, no, I, you're a special people that I'm going to I'm going to do a work through, but it was really because of their humility, their faithfulness to the Lord. Last night, I had an opportunity to brag about those at our, our network annual meeting that we had. I was able to make a video and, and, and just let people know across our network, the many campuses, what God is doing. I got to brag about North Bay for this last year. 
And I got to be able to talk about the faithfulness of people, the faithfulness of people that are giving and serving, and specifically the serving part. I was able to say hey, not only are people tithing and giving and supporting and keeping the lights on, but we're still really active involved in our community. I was able to share the faithfulness of people serving at the Food Connection. I was able to go there the other day uh, through the bridge ministry on Fridays. There was 300 bags of groceries lined up with names of individual families to pick them up and to be delivered in our community. CTK volunteers that are there. Volunteers that are going to be serving at the community toy store this week. They're going to be involved, and many of you donated so moms and dads can buy kids toys for their children. It's a beautiful, empowering thing that we do. I bragged about the Thanksgiving baskets last week. The work that we're doing is so amazing. Uh, Logan mentioned a bit about the Footprints of Hope. Here's another opportunity that we, in the most impoverished area in Malawi, Africa, Malawi is the most impoverished nation, I think still ranked, in this area, area, I think it's 23, that is the, is the most poor area. And when we give, we actually provide a small meal each day as well as Bible lessons. And you're thinking, I still want to give in a cause and I have an opportunity. Can you consider giving to Footprints of Hope? Ten bucks a day, or ten bucks a day, wow. Ten bucks or twenty bucks, whatever it takes, you can give online and do that. Why do we do that? Because God's faithfully blessed us that we can be faithful in doing that. And I tell you, you can't be out faithful than God. As you are being faithful, God's so much bigger and so much grander. I love this scripture that just speaks to me and spoke to my heart this week of holding on to unexpected hope. It says this, Hebrews says, let us hold unswervingly, unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who is promised is faithful. Has he not been faithful in your life? Will he not be faithful in this season as well? He will. And in that, we, the promise that we hope for is this. Yes, it's going to be different, but this Christmas, can I leave you with this last thought and challenge is this, to expect the unexpected. To expect the unexpected. Zechariah did not expect what happened to him. He expected to go in the temple and do the duties he's due, and we all do, and he's just being faithful to do it. And, 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 and here, this angel appears in review. And I'm not saying you're going to have an angel appear to you this week because you're being faithful. I don't know. Maybe you will. But, but I tell you what, there is some opportunities we have ahead. And I tell you, if we can expect the unexpected, and some of you are kind of going, bro, it, this last year has been a lot about expecting the unexpected. And I get that. But I wonder if we could change our jaded, complaining, bickering, upset, angst that we have about this and that, and those people get to do this, and I can't do this, and i got to wear the darn this, and do all that. What if we said enough of that? <laughs> what if we go, you know what, I'm expecting unexpected. I'm actually going to believe that God can, what if we had that expectancy that I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm going to be ready. I am going to prepare the way of the Lord this Christmas season. I am going to help usher in what God is going to do, and I'm going to, I'm going to serve my priestly role. I'm going to do, and I'm going to be faithful, and then God's going to do it through me, and I don't know what's going to happen. I know it's going to look different. I can't be with this people, and I have this going on all that. I get all that, and you and I get all that. But what if we were just saying, you know what? I'm going to expect the unexpected. I'm going to stop complaining, you know? Please, please, church, stop complaining. Stop complaining. It is time for us to step up and continue to expect and believe the unexpected. Rather than complain this week, what if we did something different? I'm going to invite Mackenzie. She closes in a, in a song with us here. Doing a great job, Mackenzie. Thank you. I want to challenge you with this week's spiritual practice. Do something unexpected for someone who would least expect it. That's a pretty simple thing to do, but you're going to have to put some planning in this a little bit. For some of you, it could be multiple people. For some of you, I know this is so small, but what if you texted someone, texted someone out of the blue and they didn't expect it? I, this last week, I did that with someone. I found out a friend in Idaho, they were part of our church. I found out he had COVID, and it's like, wow, Scott, bro, man, I'm sorry. And I reached out, and it was just like, it was a great connection with him. Who is it that this week that you know that you could reach out, a phone call out of the blue? Do, do this, here's a kind of advanced thing, I don't know, you could plan for this a little bit, but uh, we call it, on our family, we used to call it ding-dong door ditch, and so when our kids were little, 
and you test this. We could talk more on this. You got to test this idea out. But what we did is we just knew some people that could use some encouragement. And, and so what we did, our kids were probably, I don't know, what do you think, hon, you're watching online? I'm thinking maybe uh, eight, eight years old, 10 years old, you know, 12, kind of that age, upper elementary. And what we did, we used the kids to do this. We'd get some gifts, and we would we'd tell the kids to go to the door, sneak up, drop the gift or what, goodies or whatever, groceries or whatever, and then ring the doorbell and run as fast as you can in the car. We'll leave the car door, we'll leave it running. You're just going to dive into the car as it's moving. No, we didn't do that. And, and, and take off, and I'd shut the lights off, and we'd cruise along. And we were just so excited that we did this. And we'd go on to the next, you know, house, and we did that. And I love that. It was like expect the unexpected. And there was a few times, oh, the lights came on. Oh, no, you know, and did they catch us? And no one came back and thanked us, so we knew we did a good job doing that. No one needs to know. What if you caroled in your neighborhood this week, the next couple weeks? You're like, oh, people aren't doing that anymore. Yeah, what if you ring the doorbell and you're like, maybe you had a, you know, your family just sing joy to the world, the basic, your jingle bells. Come on, everybody knows jingle bells, right? Do something that's like, what do you do? What if you bless your boss this week with a coffee? You know, find out what their fancy flavors and whatever they want in it. Find out what it is and then bring that coffee to them or a coworker. There's things that we could do. Decide today what you're going to do this week. But as we close here in prayer, I want to encourage you to this. As you are expecting the unexpected, guess what? God is going to do far more more than what you expected. God is going to do so much more in your life than you ever can dream of. As we do the unexpected, God will outbeat you in that. I love the promise in Ephesians. It says, now to him who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Can we believe and do that? That is unexpected hope that, that Jesus does. I love the the the, 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 the carol. Let, we could sing it this week as a family. Oh, come all you faithful, joyful and triumphant. Come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Come, all you faithful. God is faithful. And God will do so much above when we even ask and dream or imagine. It's worth the waiting. In fact, he does the best work in his waiting. Let's let him do it. Let us let him do it in us. And let him do it through us this Christmas. Will you pray with me? Lord, we let's just be honest, Lord. We, this is different this year. And some of us, we're just struggling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we know all this and what you've done, but we're struggling right now. And I, I, I admit that on the good days, I'm doing good. Bad days, I'm not. But I pray for myself. I pray for us as a church. Lord, that, that we would be reminded of this amazing, amazing revelation that happened. And how you just use faithful, available, humble people to do your will. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to be faithful. But Lord, we don't always see the fruit. Lord, I, I struggle this week and just, just it's not really seen. In fact, it seems like more of a loss than really a gain, Lord. And you see all this. And yet, God, you're doing a deep work in us. Lord, we just want you to fix everything, but you choose to capture our hearts and do a work in us, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to be open to that. Help us to understand what you're doing. And then when we think we're at the end of ourselves, Lord, you're not done. There's unexpected hope. When we go beyond our expectations, you deliver and you reveal and you show and you, you guide us towards a greater hope. And the hope is in you. And Lord, we lay our disappointments and how we want it, who's supposed to do it, and how it's supposed to happen. We lay it at your feet and we grab onto the hope, and the hope of Christmas, because Christmas has already happened. And now we're just living it out. You came, Lord, and now, Lord, you want to come into the hearts of the people that dwell, not only in our lives, but the people around us. Lord, help us expect the unexpected. Help us to do the unexpected. And, Lord, you promised that you do far more than we could even dream, that we could even imagine as we call upon you and trust you in all of God, if there's anybody here, anybody watching that really, truly hasn't made you Messiah, has not made you the Christ, the anointed one, the Savior of their not just of their world, but their personal life, Lord, that they turn to you this day and this season. And we pray that over all the people that we'll meet, all the people we work with, all the people that truly, truly need to hear the message of Christmas, that Jesus, you are our living hope. We trust in, in Jesus' name.
Uh, those are in the house. If you want to stand your feet, and we're going to close in this song together. Those online, I encourage you, sing loud online. You can do that. That's awesome. When you're in your living room, wherever you're watching, maybe this week you're watching it, just, just let's worship the Lord here and celebrate not only the hope of Christmas, the hope even beyond of who Jesus is, is the living hope together. Why don't you know we're here to pray with you, encourage you. Anyway, online, Josh is there. There are some folks in the back in house here that we can do that together. Have a great week. Thank you.